as the chair introduced, it is the centenary year of the Poplar Council Rates Rebellion. So what I plan to do, I hope you can all see a screen in front of you now that says guilty and proud of it with a picture of a massive demonstration in Victoria Park in East London, is talk you through the story of the Poplar Council Rates Rebellion whilst drawing out some lessons from today. And I've drawn it out because I like to do things in neat lists, numbered lists of 10 key points um, that the Poplar's successful Rates Rebellion tells us that can be of use today. OK, so first of all, Poplar and its Labour movement. That's Poplar. You're imagining the um, opening uh, frames of East Enders there. That's the bend in the, the River, river Thames. It's that bend and the bit above it. It's a third of what is now Tower Hamlets Borough. So it's an East London Dockland area. Very poor area. Um, we're talking just after the First World War here. 24% poverty. Um, infant mortality was about 83 in a thousand. Um, over 30,000 people lived in overcrowded accommodation. Very, very poor area. But it also had a tradition of um, working class organisation and act action. So um, it and the surrounding areas were the centre of the new unionism movement at the end of the 19th century, including, for example, the match women's strike, which did which took place in Bow, which was part of Poplar Borough. Um, it had a really active working class suffragette movement led by uh, Sylvia Pankhurst, Minnie Lansbury and others. And it had a long tradition of socialist organisation as well. Um, different socialist groups existed around the area and they, they did kind of self-education and they did street corner meetings and they engaged people in politics. So at the end of the First World War, when suddenly most working class people had the vote, um, most but not all women, had the vote and virtually all men now had the vote. Labour in the East End was in a good position um, to go out and fight for Labour representation to encourage newly enfranchised working class voters to vote for people who would actually represent them. So that's your lesson number one. Labour built a strong movement in the East End. Its council candidates were products of that movement and fought the election specifically on the basis of independent working class representation. OK, so here they are. Here's some of them. Here's some of them. You can see my little arrow there. There's George Lansbury. There's Sam March. There's Minnie Lansbury. Um, those are some of Poplar's new councillors and their supporters. And they included, um, well, there were six women, which doesn't sound many out of 42, um, but it was actually higher than any other cohort of Labour councillors um, in the other councils in London. Um, there were postal workers, railway workers, engineers, dockers, teachers, etc. So for the first time, Poplar had a council that actually looked like its, ele its electorate. So lesson number two, Poplar councillors were local working class people. And it's notable that that included um, the Poplar working class in its diversity. So they weren't just white English, there were Jewish and Irish um, Labour councillors elected. And uh, interestingly enough, the, out, out of the six women councillors who were elected, three of them were the daughters of immigrants. Um, so Poplar Council begins to meet and they set up, so they win, they win 39 out of the 42 seats. They add some older men as well and they have an overwhelming majority on Poplar Council, which has a Labour Council for the first time ever in 1919. They sit down in this town hall, which unfortunately um, was destroyed in the Blitz, it's not there anymore, but there they are um, making their decisions. And one thing that's quite interesting if you dig in deep to the minutes of these meetings is they often openly disagreed with each other. Although they did have kind of caucus discipline, as it were, they didn't have a problem um, with disagreeing on particular areas of policy. So lesson number three um, is that Poplar Labour operated a Labour Movement United Front. There was a broad range of views amongst Labour councillors, um, open disagreement, but when they decided a strategy to fight, then they stuck to it. They didn't allow disagreement to spill it, spill over into being disruptive. So on to the left of the councillors, um, I, I, I think the two most left wing, you would say, would be Edgar Lansbury and Minnie Lansbury, who were both members of the Communist Party as well as the Labour Party. But through to the other side, you have people who were, you know, loyal royalists um, and all sorts. Some people who argued for a less combative strategy. But once the decision was made, they got behind it. OK, so what did Count, Poplar Council do when it was elected 
at the end of 1919. George Lansbury, who was the, the, the first mayor, um, he said, Labour councillors must be different from those we have displaced or why displace them? Uh, which may, so I was going to say a statement of the obvious, but obviously it's a rhetorical question rather than a statement. It may seem obvious, but um, evidently not to today's Labour councils. So I, I, I often feel it's worth printing that on a postcard and, and sending it to them all. But this is what they started doing. They built new public housing for the first time in ages. Uh, they appointed housing inspectors to go around and serve improvement notices on private landlords. If the landlords didn't improve the houses, then the council did the improvements and, and made the landlords pay for it. They took the, uh, so the major health issue of the time was tuberculosis. Uh, there was a small charity run TB dispensary in Poplar. They took it into municipal ownership and expanded it massively. They electrified the street lighting. They um, decasualized work. So people, people were actually working for the council that time on like a cash in hand basis and they gave them proper jobs. They also improved the pay of council workers and they introduced equal pay between men and women for uh, 50 years before it became legally um, obligatory for them to do so. They expanded maternity and child welfare services. They improved the baths and wash houses. They improved the parks. They just basically improved the standard of life of the working class people who elected them. But they also did some other things that were really important. They added Labour representatives to council committees. So when you had council committees that ran things like housing or child welfare or whatever, local Labour parties nominated additional members of them who weren't councillors. They received deputations at council meetings, come and talk to them about campaigns and issues in the community. And they took deputations of their own to the government to demand a better deal for their area. And they went further than that and called conferences to campaign on various issues, including things like the price of milk and the supply of coal, and they called protests. So lesson number, what are we up to four, is that Poplar Council acted as a working class rep representative body. In fact, as the working class representative body, it was elected to be. And it did so in service provision by improving services, as an employer by, you know, behaving like you would hope a Labour Council would as an employer, and I think this is crucial by making itself a center of resistance. Okay, so it wasn't just this everyday council for a year and a half and then, had, then it had this massive rapes rebellion. It was actually doing radical organizing work before then from the moment it was elected, not just in employment and in services, but in helping people to organize. Um, okay, so then after a brief post-war boom, the economy hits financial crisis and the financial crisis is based around the collapse of export trade, which means it, it hurts Poplar even more than it does other areas because it relies, so, its economy, local economy relies so heavily on the dots. Um, and one of the things that socialists would advocate at a time like that, and indeed at a time like this, is public works, i.e. that public money is spent on organising work that needs to be done, um, but also provides work for people who need work. In the case of Poplar and other councils at the time, it was road building, which I don't think is something we'd particularly advocate now, but at the time it was uh, it was very, very necessary. And Poplar set up a road building scheme which provided jobs to, to loads of men. Um, and the government kind of promised to fund it and then said it wasn't going to fund it. Um, and so Poplar was left to fall back on the unfair funding system of local government, even more unfair than the system of local government funding now. So then uh, apart from a really, really small amount, um, councils had to raise all their money locally. So they had to raise it all from their local people. Add into that the fact that the maintenance of the poor, i.e. what we would now call welfare benefits, was also a local council responsibility. So to give dole money, give welfare benefits to poor and unemployed people, you had to tax local people. Um, most of them, in, in Potter's case, were poor or unemployed. So socialists in Poplar and elsewhere demanded the equalization of rates across London. And what they meant by that was a pool, a system of pooled funding where rich boroughs put more in and poor boroughs got more out. So lesson number five, well, there you go, is that Poplar's labor movement consistently campaigned for better local government funding. Okay, explain the issues, it made a socialist critique of the system that was biased towards rich areas while, as they described it, the poor keep the poor in the poorer areas. 
And because they'd done this campaigning work, that provided the foundation for them then going on to defy the law, which we're going to come on to in a minute. The point is they had gone and they, they hadn't thought local government funding was a, you know, a uh, too complex for, for the great unwashed or something just to be discussed behind closed doors. They went out and engaged people about it. They explained how the funding worked and people came to public meetings about it and, and, and they, they understood the demand and they took part in campaigning for it. So there were contrasting approaches within the Labour Party to these issues. The fellow on the right, on the left, is George Lansbury, who was the mayor of Poplar for, um, for 1920. And the fellow on the left is Herbert Morrison, who was mayor of the neighbouring borough of Hackney and is the political and literal grandfather of Peter Mandelson. And they could be seen to, in East London at least, personify the two wings of Labour at the moment, at, at the time, which were, which were referred to at the time as the direct, direct action wing and the constitutional wing. So Lansbury and a Poplarist were direct actioners and Morrison was a constitutionalist. He said that Labour has to prove itself respect worthy, trustworthy enough to be in local government in, in order to win power. Whereas Lansbury and the, and the Poplarist said, well, if we get, come up against an unfair system, then we don't have to bow down to that system. Okay, so. Another really big difference between Lansbury and Morrison, and they had an open argument about this, which is, which is fascinating, was who tells Labour councils what to do? And Lansbury and the Poplarists were politically committed to the idea that the local Labour Party debates the issues, comes up with a strategy and tells the council what to do, and the council does it. And Morrison took the view that, well, we're elected by everybody, not just by Labour people, so we have to represent everybody, so therefore we don't have to do what the local Labour Party does. And unfortunately, these days, Morrison's view massively, massively dominates. Um, and the thing that always strikes me about it is the people who say, we're Labour councillors, we don't have to do what the Labour Party tells us because we represent everybody, never come up with a mechanism by which this, this mysterious everybody can tell them what to do. I might have more sympathy for their argument if they were calling um, big open meetings which could vote on what it thought the council should do, or if they were setting up committees of street representatives for their ward to decide what they should do. No, what they do is they think what I want to do and then say, that's what all the people want me to do, um, not what the Labour Party wants me to do. Okay, so having reached this crisis over the, uh, the road building and the collapse of funding, they were left with a choice and their choice was they could either cut some of those excellent services they'd set up um, or put the rates up or they could defy the law and they chose to defy the law and they had this wasn't just something sucked out of the thumb of a, of a councillor. Um, they had a conference of delegates from all the Labour movement bodies, Labour parties, trade unions, etc. around Poplar. They got together and they flashed out their strategy. And what they decided to do was to withhold the precepts to the cross London bodies. So those of you who live in London will know that when you pay your council tax, some of it goes to your borough council and some of it goes to a, a smaller amount of it. What, what used to be called a precept, probably still is. Um, goes to cross London bodies these days, the Greater London Authority, the Metropolitan Police um, and the Fire Service, I think. In those days, it was the London County Council, the Metropolitan Asylum Board, the Metropolitan Police and the Water Board, which was still in public ownership. So they decided to not collect and not hand over those rates so that they were only levying rates on local people to provide those local services. And... Um, they justified this with the critique of the law being biased against them. So Edgar Lansbury, who was a councillor, he said the law and justice are two different things. And Sam March, who was the mayor in 1921, said the master class has made the laws. So we're not obliged to, we're not obliged to adhere to laws that, that the class that oppresses us have created. And they took this decision to defy the law in March 1921. Um, okay, and he did put them at odds with the law. And the London County Council, unsurprisingly, didn't want a council to stop paying it its money. So it took them to court and it always puts a smile on my face, this photo. So those five guys, four of them, the four who are smiling, are leading members of the council. Um, George Lansbury, John Skir, Charlie Sumner and Sam, Sam March. The, the fellow who looks miserable 
is Jay Buto Skeggs, who was the town clerk. So he's the equivalent of today's chief executive officer of the local council. And he didn't want them to break the law, but they decided they were going to, and he had to do what they told him, which is a very interesting contrast today, isn't it? Because a lot of Labour councils say, well, the chief executive told us we had to do this. Um, in those days, other way around. Okay, so off they went to the High Court. Okay, so they devised this strategy. They said, this is what the law requires us to do. This is what these bodies can do to hold us to account for it, to, to, to make the, to get the courts to, you know, punish us or make us do this. This is how we can organise around that. So they took account of the law at the time while they were devising the strategy, but they didn't defer to it. Now, local government laws are, are different now than they were then. And so the detail of a similar strategy today would be different, but the approach could be the same. And one of the reasons I say this is that um, you will often hear people arguing against a popularist approach today, saying, well, it worked in those days because you'd get sent to prison and you could mobilize as though, as though that's easy. Um, whereas today, all that would happen is the government would send in commission, if a Labour council refused to make cuts, is the government would send in commissioners that, that would take over the council. Um, and you'd be out of power and the cuts would be made anyway. Um, but actually, the government nearly did that to Poplar. So in August 1921, the cabinet debated passing a quick law enabling it to send in officers to take over Poplar. And they decided not to, not for any legal reasons, but because they knew there would be uproar in Poplar. And the reason there'd be uproar is that this was not a movement of just a handful of councillors being martyrs. It was a mass movement that had already put thousands of people onto the streets. Oh, look, thousands of people on the streets. So the 29th of July, uh, 1921, was the day of the High Court hearing. So the court had issued a thing called a mandamus, which is an instruction to collect the money. And um, they were very clever with the law, the councillors. They they went to the High Court and they said, yes, we're breaking the law. This is why we're breaking the law, because the law's wrong. And they just used the day, the hearing, as a, a platform for making speeches about that. And 5,000 people marched. There they are marching along the East India Dock Road, for those of you familiar with the area, to the court to support them. It was all part of a movement, not just a legal process. Oh, there you go. Point number eight, Poplar's rates refusal was a mass movement, okay? They had marches, they had window bills, people putting up posters in the windows, they held public meetings, they went door knocking, they used the Daily Herald newspaper. Um, they used all kinds of activities to keep a campaign up through the whole thing, to such an extent that when, at two points during this campaign, there were two Labour councillors who resigned. And rather than that being a catastrophe, they just had a by-election and elected someone else because they had huge ranks of activists, of people who were more than happy to step into the role and take over. Okay, so the court told them, you have to collect this money or you're gonna to go to prison. And amusingly enough, the judge didn't think they would want to go to prison. So he said, if you don't pay this money, you have to go to prison in a month's time. So um, he gave them the whole of August to kind of calm down and see the error of their ways. And they didn't. They um, didn't see the error of their ways because their, their ways weren't in error. They spent August um, campaigning even more. That's a, a demonstration they had at Tower Hill. They held an old English country fair in the park in Poplar and spread their message through that. Uh, they held public meetings in every area and just built more and more support for the campaign. Now, the government was under so much pressure of this mobilization that it offered a pretty significant concession in August, it offered a, uh, a degree of pooling of rates and a Royal Commission to, to look into uh, rev uh, revising the funding of the way local government was funded in London. And um, it would have been quite easy actually for proper council at that point to say, look, that's really good. We've won more than we'd have won who haven't done this. Thank you very much. Shake hands, don't go to prison. We've won a bit. We might not have to make many cuts. Um, but they didn't because they were fighting for more than that and they knew they could could win that. And um, uh, warning, controversial point coming up. I, I often find when I speak again about um, Poplar and there are members of the Socialist Party around, they like to compare Poplar with Liverpool Council in the 1980s. 
which also refused to make cuts and and it, it made a really brave stand for a long time and it mobilized a lot of people etc um but it wasn't popular council and i think what happened in august 1921 is the is the point which distinguishes them which makes them distinct from each other because if Poplar had done the Liverpool thing, then it would have accepted that concession in August and not gone to prison and come out of it with better than when they started, but not as much as they could have won. I think that's the equivalent of what, of what Liverpool and Poplar did. Okay. So at the beginning of September, the council start getting arrested and we're still mobilizing. So that's John and Julia Skur's house. They are, they were both councillors and masses of people, mainly blokes in flat caps. Um, gathering outside their house, the mobilization continues. Um, but Poplar had not settled for less than it was fighting for. Okay. So. Arrests continue. There's my hero, Minnie Lansbury, arriving to be arrested at Poplar Town Hall. Again, masses of people there supporting, in this case, the women councillors. Five of the women councillors were arrested and taken to prison. And just as they go off to prison, the mayor and deputy mayor of Bethnal Green wish John and Julia Skir good luck. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because I'm sure some of you are wondering by this point, well, hang on, this economic recession, this funding, this awful funding system isn't entirely combined with Poplar, is it? So why aren't any other local councils defying this like Poplar are? And what's happened is it had been put to the vote at various other places where it had been voted down, often by Labour right-wingers at voting with Tories against it. So that's how it was lost in Shoreditch by about one vote or something. Um, but eventually two local councils, I have to say, I think they dragged their feet a great deal, but they did eventually vote to follow the same tactic as Poplar once the Poplar councillors were already in prison. Um, and that was Bethnal Green Council and Stepney Council. So the 10th and final lesson um, is that Poplar Council and its supporters worked to spread its action to other councils. So they didn't try to fight a lot on their own in glorious isolation. They tried to bring the rest of the movement with them, but they didn't wait for that to happen before taking action themselves. They didn't say, like, you'll often, you'll often hear, for example, trade union leaders say, of course we'd defy the anti-union laws if all the other unions would do it as well. And using the inaction of other parts of the movement as a pretext to not act now. Um, but Poplar didn't do that. It went ahead with its action anyway, whilst continuing to, to bring the uh, rest of the movement along. So that's that's the 10th of my 10 lessons. So I just need to tell you the rest of the story now. So while they're in prison, you've got 25 male councillors in Brixton, five women councillors in Holloway. Prison conditions were dreadful. The mass mobilisations continued, big demos outside the prisons, etc. Herbert Morrison, in order to prove that there was a less illegal way to do this, um, went to the Highlands of Scotland to track down Lloyd George, who was on a recuperative break there, to plead with him um, to do something about unemployment and, and poverty. And Lloyd George basically told him to naff off. Um, the councillors continued to organise behind bars, organising the campaign. They even managed to force the prison authorities to let them hold official council meetings in prison, the minutes of which still survive. Um, and the other councils eventually, Beth McGuin and Stepney, joined in. And under all that pressure, in the middle of October, they were released. That's all of them outside Brixton Prison. They released. They were released to go to a conference about reforming local government funding in London. And the hastily rushed through Parliament, local government, local authorities, financial provisions at 1921, introduced cross London pooling of outdoor relief. That's so that's welfare benefits costs up to scales set by the Ministry of Health. Poplar gained over a quarter of a million pound per year in 1921 money. So lots of money and other poor boroughs gained as well. And um, my trade union's general secretary, Jimmy Thomas, the general secretary of the NUR said at the time, this is a great discouragement to those who believe in constitutional action and a great encouragement to those who believe in revolutionary methods. And I completely agree with Jimmy, except that he thinks that's a bad thing, um, but I think it's a good one. And there ends the PowerPoint and my opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Janine, that was great. Um, 
so just hand over to Josh now and um, Josh is going to talk for 15 minutes and then we'll have questions and comments and discussion. Um, so uh, as Cathy said, I'm, I'm Josh, I'm Josh Lovell um, and at least for the next five days um, I'm a Labour councillor in Hertfordshire uh, where I represent a uh, division in Stevenage which is where I live. Um, so I've been asked to speak today about council cuts in the modern era um, and my own experience in Hertfordshire. Um, so I'm not going to be saying masses about Poplar in truth, because I've left that to Janine. Um, the story is inspiring and I do draw on some of the lessons there, um, but I'm keeping it a bit more to, to, to the modern era so we can uh, reflect on, you know, how the modern context uh, relates to what happened in 1921, 100 years ago this year. Um, so some of the things I'm going to say, however, are uh, um, different in England, Scotland or Wales, because there's slightly different funding arrangements for some of the devolved regions um, in the UK. Um, and there's been different scales of cuts. Um, so, for example, in Wales and Scotland, the total amount lost um, in local government funding has been a lot less than that in England. But as I've understood it, the broad trends remain the same. So what I want to do is make a few points that I'll split my talk up into. Uh, firstly, I want to give some context for um, local government funding over the past decade. Um, I want to explain how it's changed. Um, I want to explain what Labour's role in local government has been in this time um, and what I think is needed to reverse some of the cuts we've seen. Um, I want to say a bit more about, um, uh, you know, why it is that I'm not standing again to be a councillor um, in the local elections that are next week. Um, and to try and make this a bit more accessible, I've, I've you know, I've included a number of graphs, which I hope will help demonstrate some of the points I want to make, but I'll try and explain these, so hopefully they're not too confusing. Um, so I think it's probably useful to start by saying where money in local government comes from and how this has changed in recent years, because it's quite different to um, uh, London as it was in 1921, as Janine's described. So what I'm showing here is uh, the net income of all councils in England from uh, 2009, um, when Labour was in power through to 2019 after nine, 10 years of the Tories. And it's split by uh, grants and business rates, which are collected in this bar in purple. Um, and then uh, council tax, which is in the, the represented by the blue in the bottom half of these plots. And I think you can see, um, so, sorry, so there's, there's basically three main areas that uh, local government receives its funding. So grants from national government, property taxes on homes, which is the council tax, and then property taxes on local businesses. And you can kind of see three trends in this, can't you? You can see that this total amount is coming down, okay? There's been a, a, a big um, cutback in the amount of money that um, um, is available to local government about, by about 10 billion pounds. Um, I think it's about 20% in real terms. Um, secondly, you can see that over the same period, the amount that is being raised in council tax is going up. And over that 10 year period, it's gone up by about 20 to 25%. And that the total amount available in grants and business rates is almost halved. So you can see that in 2009-10, the amount that was collected from local businesses and from the government in grants was about 40 billion pounds. Whereas by a couple of years ago, and it shrunk even more by the way, um, in the last year or two, um, is more like um, you know 20 to 25 billion. So it's, it's almost halved in that in that region. Um, there are, however, some other trends that have happened that you can't see in these plots. So firstly, there are other ways that um, councils can raise money. So they can issue things like parking charges. Um, they can issue civil fines in some instances, um, and they can get involved in joint private um, initiatives. So one example, not too far away from me is, the, is, is Luton Council, who have a majority stake in the local airport. So you can see that councils can also get additional strings of income through um, going hand in hand with business um, uh, to, to collect money from you know, the private economy. I think the second thing that you can't see in the previous plots that you can hear is that um, the share of funding from council tax is continuing to rise. And this is the projection by 24, 25 in orange. Um, um, that if you, uh, but previously what it showed was if you added together the grants uh, from government and the business rates together, in total that part is falling. Um, but if you look at those things separately, you can see that actually um, the business rates are going up. So the amount that councils are now collecting from local uh, businesses is increasing. Um, 
But what this also doesn't show is that the proportion that's being collected by central government for redistribution is also decreasing. OK, what the effect of this, I think, um, points at is this increasing monetization of councils. So what it's doing is pushing local council service provision um, to be more dependent on local private economies, either through the joint initiatives I've described or through the rates provided to them by local companies. So um, this drives competition between local authorities to compete for businesses to set up in their localities. And since the amount that's then distributed by um, um, basically because the amount that's then redistributed by national government from rates is reducing. Now, what, the way that I see it, this is that it's a direct attack on needs based service provision. So authorities with more thriving local economies de facto win out over those with poor economies who can't provide us the same service levels back to their um, back to their residents. So this leads kind of to the first point I want to make, um, and that's that not only is the amount of money provided uh, to local um, government short by literally tens of billions of pounds to, to pro provide what it was even doing 10 years ago. Um, and that was true before COVID hit. Uh, the longer term funding model that's been driven into local government um, by the Tories is one that embeds a localised, uh, marketized logic into councils. As he, like, what is good for local business is good for the local council. Um, and this is kind of why so many have been so hard hit over the last year in particular. Businesses have been stalled, they've been closed, the councils have been left without a significant source of their income, and the government failed to step in with a complete bailout. So all in all, it means that there's a significant funding crisis in local councils. This puts at risk service provision of things like firefighting and rescue support in Hertfordshire, um, in other council areas, th uh, things such as flood and climate change mitigation measures, uh, school repairs, the running of libraries, support for children in care. There is more and more, of course. And none of this is a prediction, by the way. All of this is happening and it's, and it, and it's going to get worse, unfortunately. And we can see the impact the funding has had if we think about examples such as Luton, where I mentioned the airport earlier. Because of that um, massive funding loss from the airport, Luton had to pass an emergency budget in July last year to save £22 million over the following year. Um, we've seen issues in Nottingham. We've seen Tower Hamlets going through a massive, or well, attempting to go through a, a major fire and rehire um, uh, scheme. But they are also short by millions. Croydon Council had to init issue a section 114 notice to basically say we can't do anything but our minimum level of service. So there are real problems. Um, and what I want to do now is just talk about Labour's role um, a little bit. Um, so it's not actually the biggest party in local government, possibly not a surprise, um, but Labour do have significant political weight and power. Um, so what you can see here is um, a, a couple of plots that show the proportion of Tory, Labour, Lib Dem and then other um, um, parties represented in different aspects of local government. Um, now, this was true in 2019. It might change next week. It's not clear by how much, but at least these figures are broadly correct um, as, of, uh, as of today. Um, and what they show is um, of the 20,000 or so councillors that there are in the UK, about one in three uh, represent Labour. That's about 6,200. Of the 400 principal councils in the UK, um, so that gets rid of things like um, uh, parish councils. If, if, we, if we exclude things like parish councils, about 400 in the UK. And, and Labour uh, control about 30% of those, about 120 of those. Um, of the elected um, Metro mayors, half are Labour, over 60% of the executive mayors are as well. And what I see in these figures um, are, you know, a potential huge political wedge. You know, Labour and local government are in charge of administering tens of billions of pounds annually. They directly oversee council service provision in every corner of England, Scotland and Wales and have thousands of representatives. Um, I mean, admittedly, there are fewer now than there were in the 70s and the 80s um, when there were some serious struggles uh, within local government. For example, in 1972, there was the uh, struggle in Clay Cross. In 84, you had, uh, you had, you had um, um, fights in Lambeth and in Liverpool when Labour had about eight to 10,000 councillors in total. Now, that number isn't radically larger than the 6,000 that we have today. Um, but I think certainly what um, some of those struggles showed was that it was the efforts of even half a, or, you know, a few dozen can have quite wide reaching consequences. And that was certainly true in Poplar. Um, at the same time, the fight to restore fat funding to councils is virtually non-existent. And I don't think this problem is one of numbers. 
So what I want to do is talk about, I think, uh, you know, the two main barriers um, that are that are keeping back a fight to actually win this restored funding, that I think so desperately needed, not just me, I think pretty much everybody that's involved in local government agrees that it needs this money. And I think they fall into two, uh, two, two, two categories, although I'm sure in the discussion, if you've got other ideas and other perspectives that you think I haven't included, please raise them. Um, I think the two things come down to industrial um, barriers. And I think there's a, a barrier in terms of the people and organizations that we have right now. So let's talk first about this, um, this industrial barrier. So what I wanted to show here firstly was how periods of intense struggle have mapped directly to the same times where struggles in local government have been victorious. So what this shows is from the you know, late 1800s through to the modern era, the amount of days on strike uh, people took in the UK. And what you can see is of the six or seven where there was the most intense periods, uh, three of them mapped directly to 1921 when we saw the Poplar Rates Rebellion, 1972 when we saw a major fight back in Clay Cross, another victorious one, in 1984 as well, uh, Liverpool Council when they, as, as Janine said, uh, won, um, uh, won a, a big grant back, back from the government during the, uh, during the minor strike. So the point I want to make with this is that these periods of class struggle raise the ambitions of working class representatives to fight for more, the expectations from those who elected them to do so are heightened as well. So if you compare the intensity of strikes in those years with now, uh, where in the last 30 years we've only gone past um, you know, one million working days disrupted by strikes on four occasions, the last time was uh, here and that was 2011, it's, it's sort of unsurprising that there's not a big fight back going on uh, amongst councillors. So I think this has also been exacerbated by a few things. Um, so Thatcher, Major and now Cameron's anti-union laws basically blocked our ability to build strikes. Um, I think Labour's passivity and government to repeal in any of that legislation uh, hampered that further. But also in this in this sort of, uh, you know, um, Thatcherite attack on working class living conditions from the early 80s onwards, um, the gutting of local democracy and the numbers of people employed in local government has now fallen by about a million in the last 10 years, like one in three local government jobs are now gone since 2010. You know, this has hampered our ability to build fight backs and you know altogether I don't think it's particularly surprising that there isn't a militant movement to try and win back this restored funding though I don't think it should be a barrier to efforts being made um, secondly I want to talk about the personnel involved you know the people who are involved in shaping policies and actions in local government as councillors and as activists where in my view we've got a, a problem which is uh, um, you know we, we've got we've got a, a war on two fronts in some ways um, on the one hand we have a, a, an overdominance of the labour right in local government. I don't think this, this one really needs to be explored in more detail, uh, but we have uh, you know, uh, the labour right who have been in power for decades in various councils, and many of whom um, have very willingly passed on Tory cuts directly to their communities without much comment, and in some circumstances with praise for you know, things like prudent financial planning. On the other hand, we have the Labour left, which I think is worth more discussion here, certainly amongst the people at present. Um, and, and, and that's that, you know, in one of the first acts of the Corbyn and McDonnell uh, leader, well, the Corbyn leadership with Corbyn and McDonnell was, uh, was a letter that was signed, uh, published by The Guardian, which basically said uh, left wing councillors shouldn't be pushing for no cuts budgets. They shouldn't be pushing for needs based uh, budgets in their in their council chambers. Um, more on that, you know, within a year, I think, or two, it was, um, you have, uh, you know, highly left wing dominated Labour Party conferences. Uh, and then one of them uh, passes a rule change that now allows Labour groups to suspend or expel councillors who don't back their own budgets if they're in a ruling group. So, you know, whatever your view might be on cuts to budgets, the effect that this had on lefty councils, uh, councillors who were critical of the cuts, um, were, were that they, you know, they must now vote for them to save themselves from expulsion. And to me, I feel that that gutted any resistance before this could even begin to properly form. And I think together, you know, what happens with regards, um, uh, you know, the local uh, government left in Labour, um, these represent some of the, well, this, this, this represents one of the biggest failings, I think, in Labour, on the Labour left in the last six years. So there's, there's also a new current on top of this as well. Um, and that's that, um, you know, uh, progressives in local government are now uh, uh, quite, you quite often hear people talking about the Preston model or what's happening in Salford. 
um, and broadly this comes under this category of uh, a thing called community wealth building. So in short, what this has done is allowed public contracts to be tended more easily to small and medium sized businesses in their local areas. So they previously wouldn't have been possible because you know, much larger corporations that have probably gone in and, and, and bidded for those contracts. So you've got proponents of this Preston model who are citing this as being an attack on multinational corporations whose you know, predatory capitalism has wreaked havoc on towns like, uh, or towns and cities like Preston and Salford. And some have gone as far as talking about this as you know, building working class power. I think you know, from the perspective of a Marxist, I, this, just, this doesn't fly. So like, you know, Preston Salford is more simply bourgeois localism, but it's being packaged as radical municipal socialism. Um, unfortunately, though, the, the broad labor left have kind of absorbed the latter definition. So I've dropped in here a quote from uh, Momentum's 2021-24 plan. Um, I shan't read it out, but it's very much, you know, it's very much accepted the idea that, you know, Preston and Salford are municipal socialist movements. Um, you know, and this is this is the you know the far left of Labour in many in many regards touting this as the solution to transforming local government. Um, despite this having nothing to say on the huge cuts to local, central government grants I referred to earlier, I would add to that that though it has been slower, that is the cuts in Salford and Preston, they still have made them in significant measures. Um, and even Salford's council leader admitted this in a Tribune article, um, I think earlier this year in in, in January that since 2010, they've lost half of their staff and they've had to make compulsory redundancies. So much as they are making, you know, uh, you know that some of their services have survived better than other councils, uh, it's certainly not a, a model that I think socialists should be advocating uncritically. Um, so basically, look, I think there are, there are problems on both the left and the right of Labour um, with those 6,000 or so representatives and certainly uh, potentially with some of the thousands that want to get um, elected next week. Um, so what is needed? Uh, I don't want to spend too long reflecting on this. I think this is better for the discussion. Um, I think the answer is complex. Um, I think, however, there are some important things that we should advocate. I think first and foremost, that we should be building struggles to, uh, to fight and defend the services that we've got. Uh, this is a picture here of Molescombe Primary School, which is facing uh, an academization process right now. And I think that, ref that reflects, and a lot of these anti-academies struggles reflect some of the, uh, you know, broad community labor movement joint action that we can build uh, to resist the privatization in this case of a school that's under its uh, local authority management um, i think broadly we, there are campaigns to to win in sourcing that we should be uh, fighting for and i think as well we need to overturn these you know bureaucratic self-harming rules that labor's tied itself up with with regards to expelling and suspending councillors for passing on cuts to the communities that elect them as far as i'm concerned they're an affront to democracy uh, they're damaging to the people we represent. It would be a no-brainer to abolish those rules. But I think there's a final ingredient. Okay, and to me, what I think is the spirit of Poplar. Like, I think we need representatives who are prepared to see fights through to their logical conclusions. Um, and in this instance, local campaigns, you know, some of them might be battles with individual councils, but you know, some are going to become confrontations with the government. You know, a government as well that's hell bent on stripping the powers and finances of local councils. Um, I think popular councillors were prepared to go to jail to defend the people who elected them. And that level of punishment just doesn't exist today. Janine's pointed this out. And, and the way I see it is the barriers facing popular um, people in popular then were far higher than those today. And I think that means that there's much less of an excuse for anyone to, to do anything now. Um, there are more things, but we should leave those to discussion. I've got a couple more things I'd like to say, and then I'll, then I'll um, um, come back to you, Catherine. Um, so I was elected as a councillor in 2017. Um, since then, I've grown more critical of, I guess, the weight and role that councillors uh, play now. Um, to start with, um, I think the, the type of politics done in council chambers and committees can be quite top down. I think it can have a conservatising effect on people's politics um, with, you know, day to day interactions rarely being with, you know, the council staff who are running the services, but with senior management who oversee them. Um, you know, I've had to develop my own networks within the staff at Hertfordshire County Council so that I can properly evaluate decisions I'm being asked to approve, which are being written and largely underlined by senior managers. I think there's an issue for lefties in either ruling or opposition groups when they're in a minority. Um, they've got the difficulty of organising within Labour, you know, groups dominated by right-wingers who might prefer passivity, like 
Um, this year, I had to break the group whip uh, to vote against a Tory budget in, uh, in February. Uh, the majority of the group wanted to abstain on that. I said, not, no way am I doing that. But there are councillors out there who face this level of pressure all the time um, on a weekly basis. So it's, you know, to me, it's not surprising that some of them get broken down over sustained periods. Um, neither, I don't think it's obvious the answer to that is simply winning majorities of lefty councillors in, in Labour groups. Um, the experience, for example, in Haringey to oppose the development vehicle, as I've understood it, so correct me if I'm wrong, is that even when the left majority beat off the HDB plans, they since pushed through other plans that were more or less consistent uh, with the previous ones or only marginally better. You know, and, and, and those are, you know, that council is referred to as a momentum council. It's seen as a very left wing council. So I think coupled with, you know, the, the industrial context that I described earlier, on balance, I've decided to stand down um, because I want to give more time to building instead in my workplace, in my union and in the Labour Party. I think the most important task of Marxists in Britain right now is to fight to revolutionise our unions and our party to build the strikes uh, and the working class organisations which can successfully reverse the cuts we've seen in local governments. But these cuts have been happening elsewhere, right? It's not just lo like local government has been savaged by the Tories. Um, um, and, and, and left to be prized open, I'd add by, you know, the Labour government of 97, 2010. Um, so I do want to add here before I finish, though, that there are actually, you know, I, I say all that, I do think there are many good things that councillors can and should do. Um, and if you know good lefties who are standing uh, as, as a councillor or are councillors, um, some of these are things you might encourage them to do if they're not doing them already. So one example in my four years was helping to build a big strike against uh, the academization of a local school. Uh, we got this to you know, national press attention um, and we built basically a complete community wide campaign. Now, it didn't quite look uh, like uh, the, the Poplar Rates Rebellion pictures, but this was, you know, parents and students, uh, local people who lived near the school. It was all of the school unions. It was the local councillor and another um, few councillors who were you know, represented in the area as well. We held big public meetings with 200 people. We marched through the town. Um, you know, some of these meetings were the biggest political gatherings in the town for over a decade. So I'm not wanting to over hype it to the level of Poplar, but you could see a level of, uh, you know, big, broad, maybe mass in terms of the uh, scale of Stevenage, maybe a, maybe a small mass movement. Um, there are other things I did, including publicly challenging the chief executive over pay inequality in the council. Uh, I voted on my own in that instance again uh, to approve a £180,000 salary. Um, I was heckled in the chamber for doing that, um, but I got that into the local press and something like 80% of people who saw this report were in favour of what I did. Uh, what I find is being a lefty in a council can leave you feeling quite small and isolated until you open up these arenas to greater public oversight and you find that lots of people actually tend to agree with you. Um, there are other things I've done with the FBU uh, which have resulted in, you know, there still being f um, fire vehicles in Watford that wouldn't have been had we not... Uh, put up demonstrations outside council chambers, for example. And I think finally, the, the one thing I think is, you know, quite a straightforward thing to ask all councillors to do, and that's to provide some of their stipends directly to the labour movement that they're there to represent. Um, since 2018, I've given 10% of my uh, stipend to the UVW and IWGB unions. And last week I added it all up and it comes to somewhere between three and four thousand pounds that I've um, allocated in that time. Um, that was straight from the money that I'm given as a sort of as a, as a stipend or a wage um, for my councillor role. I just, you know, I, I, I tried to think if all of those 6,000 representatives did something like that, the sort of um, fighting fund the left could have, it would be quite, it would be quite enormous. So look, um, here are my summary points. I'm not going to, I'm not going to read them all out um, because I've, I've gone over my time substantially. Um, Basically, I think there are many things we can be doing about this. Um, I think we need to take forward the spirit of Poplar into what we're doing uh, to fight back to win restored funding today. Um, and I will leave it there as I look forward to discussing more with people here about Poplar and also about the, the modern context of uh, local government funding and what we could do to reverse what I present as quite a bleak prospect, but one that I think we have to stand up and fight back against. So uh, thank you for hearing me and uh, yeah, look forward to discussion. Thanks.